Father, we come to you here on this Lord's Day. We thank you again for each and everything you do in our lives. We thank you for the rest you gave us last night. We thank you for the rain we had yesterday. We just pray, Lord, that you uh, bless this day. And just put a hedge around each and every one of us. Just keep us all healthy and safe. And for those that are sick and not able to be here, that you put your healing touch on them and just uh, allow them for safe return later on. And, and Father, we just pray that you'll bless this service, give your servant the words to speak. And Father, we just pray that Ipa's hearts and minds will be open to hear the word. And Father, we just pray that as we close in on uh, Christmas, that people's hearts will be in the right place and, and, and take advantage of this opportunity to go out and try to witness to people. As oftentimes people are more open to hear the hear the gospel, hear your word at this time of the year as many are depressed or just uh, know what it, its theory is supposed to be representative. And so oftentimes they're just more open to receive tracts or whatever, maybe. And so, Father, we just pray that you'll uh, be with those pastors and missionaries that are out there preaching your word today that, that are making that stand for that King James Bible. And we pray, Lord, that Christians in this nation that don't have their eyes opened up and realize that they need to turn away from all these corrupt Bibles and, and turn to the King James Bible, get back into the word, what you gave us, Lord. You promised you'd preserve your word, and you have. Those that say you have not make you a liar, Lord, and they will stand before you one day and answer for that. And so, Father, we just pray that this nation will repent of her many sins and, and that the people will will turn back to you, and, and especially those, as I said, like the ones that are, that are say they're Christian, but yet they're out there protesting and making a stand for abortion and LGBTQ and and for um, anti-Israel and all these other things that are out there. You know, they're out there supporting the mosque terrorists and so forth, and, and yet they want to condemn Israel. I mean, it just shows you the state of this nation. You know, they want to go around and have after school programs for Satan, but yet they don't want you to mention the name of Jesus in school when it's not illegal. So Lord, it just shows you the state of our nation that we're in desperate, desperate need of, of a miracle from you, Lord. So we pray that you'll condemn our, our leaders, get them to turn from their wickedness and stop trying to promote the one world government and, and get right with you, Lord. And so Father, we just ask that you bless this service be with each and every one. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, we're going to, we've been studying the I Am Statements by Jesus, but we're going to take a, a small little break from that since we have Christmas coming up. And once we uh, get done, then we'll go back and finish up uh, dealing with that sermon there, that study. So this morning, I want to, title of my sermon is the word became flesh and this will probably i'm going to probably uh, be a couple weeks longer or something we'll, we'll see how it goes but the, the, like i said the, the title is the word became flesh you know that's that's very important there you know chick tracks they actually have a a, a track that's it's, it's what the title of it is and <clears throat> it's uh we're going to see the significance of how important that is. Now, as we prepare to celebrate Christmas, you know, we know Christmas, it's a week from tomorrow. So, you know, we're not that far away, as I said in my opening prayer, that, that we need to take advantage of this time of year when people are more open to hear the God. You know, it's kind of like Halloween when, you know, the kids come to your door, then you can give them tracks where, you know, most of the time, you know, it's hard to give them to them. But, you know, on those that day, you take advantage of what is given to us. You know, whether they're secular or not. I mean, we all know that Christmas isn't really the day that Jesus was born on and so forth. And, and it, you know, reality is it actually came from a, a heathen um, holiday and so forth. But that the point is, we still kind of, quote, make it into the birth of Jesus. And so let's take advantage of what, what we have so that we can try to win some souls. As I said, as we prepare to celebrate Christmas as the birth of Jesus, then I want to look at an often overlooked aspect of the Christmas story. You know, we're always usually here of, you know, the birth of Jesus. We hear all the, 
you know, the basic stuff at Christmas time. Well, I want to touch on something a little bit different this time. We are told in Scripture that Jesus is the Word. You know, that's a capital W D, you know, W O R D. Now there's a difference there between the word and you know, we'll look at that later on and lowercase word. And it says, uh, you know, we are told in scripture that Jesus is the word and that the word became flesh. So let's take a look at John chapter one and then look at verses one and two. So John chapter one, verses one and two. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. You know, look at those verses clear, carefully. You know, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. It's telling you, the Word is God. You know, and it says, The same was in the beginning with God. Then we go down to verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, I titled it, The Word Became Flesh, but really, I guess I should have, you know, done what the King James says and said, you know, the Word was made flesh. You know, so we, uh, you know, that's what the title of my sermon is coming from, this verse here, this verse 14 here. So, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So, now, look, think about that. The Word we just saw was God, and He's made flesh and He's dwelt among us. So, you know, God was dwelling among the people. You know, that was at the time when Jesus walked on the earth here at His first coming. Now, we will look later at some more places that show Jesus as the Word. Now, it is important to understand the significance of Jesus as the Word becoming flesh and what it really means. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, shows us that Jesus, as the Word, and the second person of the Godhead, has always existed and has been there since the beginning. You know, John 1, 1 clearly shows the Word was with God the Father in the beginning and is God. You know, that, that's, that's significant. You know, everybody always thinks, oh, well, Jesus came about at, you know, had his birth there in Bethlehem, you know, with, with you know, the, the son of Mary, you know, and, and uh, you know, they, they don't realize that he's the only begotten son of God the Father. It's not really even the son of Mary, you know, yes, it's his mom in a sense, his earthly mom, but he wasn't created at that time, like the cults try to teach us and so forth, that that uh, he's always been there from the beginning, and that, that this just wasn't a man that was born to Mary. This was God in the flesh that was born to Mary. Now, Jesus would have to be God to have been around since God has. You know, Jesus as God has no beginning. You know, we know, I mean, God has always existed. You know, he's self-existent. He's, you know, nobody created him. You know, people always say, well, who created God? Well, even if you want to have that argument, okay, so and so created God. Well, then who created that person then that created God, you know, or that being or whatever? And then, okay, well, there was this other, you know, some people like they, they pass off the thing like, oh, well, people on earth came from aliens. Okay, well, then where did those aliens come from? Well, they came from these other aliens that came on their planet and then created them. Okay, well, then where did those other aliens come from that created them? You know, I mean, eventually you got to get to the point somebody has to be that, that's always existed. You know, somebody has to be there. It's just always there. That, that person is God. And <clears throat> so, you know, God has always existed. And it, it tells us that Jesus is the Word and that He is God and He's always been there. So, you know, He has to be God because it tells us He's always been there from the beginning and it tells us He's God. But John 1.14 shows only the beginning of Jesus as the God-man in the womb of Mary. <clears throat> John 1.14 is really what the Christmas story is all about. You know, so we see that, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, he came in the flesh. That's what, that's really what this is all about. It's God came to dwell among us so that he could get, die for our sins. That's what Chris, Christmas story is truly all about. It's not about this little baby in a manger and, and all this stuff we try to make it out to be and, 
and, and that type of stuff that it, it, it's, uh, it's more than that, you know, but as I said, this was not the beginning of Jesus as his existence, only his existence as the God man, but he as God has always existed. Now, normally at Christmas time, we always focus on Jesus as a baby in a manger, but do not fully understand that that baby was the word who became flesh, you know, or who was made flesh as the King James Bible says. So, you know, like I said, it, it's not just some baby in there. You're like, oh, that's a cute little baby. Where it's not like a baby we see anywhere else. You know, this was some special baby. This was God in the flesh Himself. Now, you must understand that, as I showed in John one one, that the Word is God, and so one four John one fourteen is shown us that Jesus has to be God as well, and that when Jesus became flesh, then it was God in the flesh. You know, that's why it says that God uh, was made flesh. You know, that, that's that's important. You know, and he dwelt among us. You know, I mean, if you're flesh, that's, that's an actual being. I mean, that's, you know, like I can be touched. You know, Jesus could be touched by his disciples. You know, he, he could be held with a little baby. He could be, he could, uh, you know, run around as a child. He could, you know, do all. He was, you know, there, that was, he was there just as much a man as I am. Except he was a special man. He was the God man. You know, he wasn't just man. He was also fully 100% God. He never lost his deity. You know, he became in the flesh, so he was 100% man, but he still was 100% God at the same time. He never lost his deity, you know, as people try to say. Uh, now, one of Jesus' names is that is Emmanuel, which means God in the flesh. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. You know, we, we learn about that in Isaiah, where he's actually called Emmanuel, and it's spelled, you know, I am. And then in the New Testament, it's spelled E-M. But we t we're told here in Matthew chapter 1, 23, that the word Emmanuel means God in the flesh. So let's take a look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth his son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, it is important to understand that the Messiah and the Savior had to be God as only God could fulfill this role as a sinless man. You know, the, the, the Pharisees and all the scribes and everybody, they missed the point that, you know, when Jesus was saying he was God, that he was also the Messiah, they, they, they didn't understand. I mean, if they read scripture, they would have understood the Messiah had to be God. He could not do the things unless he was God, that what they was predicted of the Messiah. You know, that only the most, only God can die for our sins. I can't die for anybody's sins. Nobody can die for my sins or anything else. You know, that I'm a sinner and just like everybody else, and everybody else is a sinner, so they wouldn't do any good to die for me. You know, only Jesus was sinless, and that's what allowed him to be our Savior. Now, he was tempted like everybody else. You know, he was God, but that doesn't mean he wasn't still tempted like everybody else as a man then, you know, he, he could have sinned if he chose to. He chose not to. You know, just like we, we could choose not to sin. Now, God is the Word became flesh or a man for us in order to bring salvation to his cre creation. You know, that's why he became a man. That was the whole point of why he became a man. Or he became that little baby in the manger we always think of. is so that he could then grow up as a man and then die on that cross for us, shed his precious blood so that he could... He could <laughs> Bring us salvation. You know, he's bringing salvation to the very creation that he created, you know, as the creator. And yet his own creation rejected him, you know, for the most part. And they still do today. Now, Jesus lowered himself even below angels. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. You know, we know right now that, that man is below even angels. Now, one day that's going to be reversed and we'll be higher than angels. But right now, man is lower than angels. So here is God, the creator, who even created the angels, which are above man, as well as creating man. He lowered himself even below the angels so that he was, you know, as a man, became a man. You know, that was to bring salvation for us. God didn't bring salvation to, to angels. So we ought to be thankful for that. You know, the angels that rebel, they're, they're doomed to like a fire for all eternity. You know, Jesus came as a man to bring us salvation. He, you know, he didn't bring that salvation to angels. Now, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, 
that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Like I said, he took that death so that he, for every one of us, he died on the cross for every single person that's ever lived or ever will live until he returns, you know, and, and uh, at the end of the millennium, when, when uh, returns before that. But, you know, even if those who get saved in the millennium, but at the end of that, then, you know, that's it. For when that last person gets saved, he died for each and every person that's ever lived during all that time or will live. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, like I said, it's important to understand that he died and became a man to die for our salvation. That's why I've said before that there can't be aliens on the planets because they would all, you know, since all of creation has been cursed because of Adam's sin, so they would all die and go to the lake of fire just like the angels will because just like Jesus didn't bring salvation to angels, he didn't come as a little green man or something like that, you know, so... You know, that's not how God works. You know, the angels knowingly sin, where there's, if there was these aliens, they wouldn't know any different. Now, today, cults, false religions, and too many people see Jesus not as God, but as just a man. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses and others, you know, they all say, you know, he was just a created being and so forth. You know, Mormons, oh, he was the first created being, or this or that, but, you know, they, they, they are, they're, they're, it's always, oh, he was just a good man, you know, the... Buddhist and all them, you know, oh, he was a good man like uh, like Buddha or something. But, you know, most as a good man, but a man nonetheless, you know, a lot of them don't even, uh, you know, like I said, most of them, they don't ever see him as God. And, and, you know, most of them will tell you, oh, yeah, he was a good man. You know, but, they, but that's it. They'll just say he was just a man. You know, I mean, there's not too often they'll be like, oh, he was a terrible man or something, you know, because people know better. I mean, Satan knows he can't totally deceive people that way that, that you know so oh, there was a good man but they'll try to deny his deity but as i said jesus never lost his deity when he became the god man now jesus as the word is god and it was that word who became flesh or was made flesh if the word is god and the word became flesh then jesus has to be god now when jesus came on that first christmas then his only purpose was to bring salvation to man. You know, I said that. You know, his second coming is going to come as the king. He's going to come as the judge. The first time he came to bring salvation to man. That was the only reason why he came. And, you know, as I said, so it's clear that if, if he is the word and the word is God, then, and the word became flesh, then Jesus has to be God. You know, and God is clearly telling us that, you know, John was telling us there clearly that, that God is, Jesus is God. Now, we have seen this in my study on the I am statements of Jesus that we've been going over on, you know, how his purpose was to bring salvation to man. You know, we saw that where he told us over and over different things. But let's look at John chapter 12, verse 47. And you'll notice that most of these things are in the book of John or, or things written by, by John. You know, we'll see in Revelation, 1 John, and so forth. But, you know, because John is all about, the, the gospel of John is all about to show that Jesus is God. You know, that's really the purpose behind that gospel. But John chapter 12, verse 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. So he, he, he was, this was Jesus talking here. And he was telling the people. I didn't come to judge the world because they wanted him to judge certain people. And they said, he's like, I didn't, you know, I didn't come to judge the world. You know, I came to save the world. Now, like I said, he will judge the world one day when he comes back his second time. But right now, the first time his purpose was to save the world. Then he will later on judge the world. You know, us as Christians, that's what we're supposed to People always say we can't judge people, but that's not true. Jesus has allowed us to judge them by their fruit and so forth. You know, that right now we're trying to doing the, the, the job of being the judge. And then later on, Jesus will come as judge. But he came that first time to bring salvation. Now, Jesus is mentioned as the word a total of seven times in Scripture. Now, we have seen the first four times in John chapter 1, 1, which had three of them. And then John chapter 1, verse 14, that's the fourth one. The next two are found in 1 John. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. And we'll notice that, again, this is, you know, both in, um, you know, they both start off, you know, in the first chapter, in the first two verses. So, again, you know, they're both by John. We see the, uh, 
how, how you know he, he keeps his pattern. But look at First John chapter one, verses one and two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So just as the Gospel of John starts off by proclaiming Jesus is the Word and God, so does 1 John 1. You know, as I said, you know, he, 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 that's what John's, piss, uh, you know, all of his writings are basically showing you about how God, Jesus is God. You know, we see Revelation where, where he sees, you know, shows Jesus in his full glory. You know, we've been studying that, that book and so forth. So, you know, that's what John's writings are all about. Is really showing that Jesus is God. Now, in 1 John 1, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we see Jesus was there from the beginning. Again, someone can only be at the beginning if they were God. You know, so just like we saw in John, the Gospel of John, then you know, he got Jesus was there from the beginning. You know, the, he's the, and it says he's the word of life. You know, who's the one that gives us life? You know, it's Jesus, Jesus, you know, God. You know, he was our creator. Now, John then says that he and the other disciples had heard and seen with their eyes and handled or touched the word of life. You know, it says in verse 1 of uh, John 1, 1, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. So again, it's that he came as flesh. As I said, he could be touched. He could be handled. He could be looked upon. You can look at me. You know, I'm not invisible. I'm not like a, I'm not a spirit. I'm not an angel where I'm invisible or something. I mean, you could see me. You may not want to look at me, but, you know, you could see me. You could touch me if you were, if you're here. You know, as I said, this confirms John chapter 1 verse 14 that Jesus as the word became flesh. Now, Jesus as flesh, as I said, could be touched and seen and be heard when he spoke, you know, you can hear me when I'm speaking. I mean, unless you're deaf or something, but if you can still see that I'm speaking or whatever. So, but he was not spiritual and invisible like angels. You know, it is important that Jesus was seen and could be heard for this confirmed that he was flesh and he had to be flesh in order to take a place on the cross and die for our sins. But he also had to be the word as God in order to bring that salvation. You know, so John confirms here that Jesus was the God-man. You know, as I said, he had to be 100% man in order to, you know, to die on, uh, take our place on the cross. He had to be 100% man so he could be just like me, so he could be tempted of sins. He could live a sinless life and so forth. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, God, but he wasn't a man. You know, he had to become a man in order to die for us. As I said, that's why he didn't become an angel. You know, he became a man. You know, it was just, if he just... Playing God, it, it wouldn't do anything. And so, but yet he also still had to be 100% God because only God can bring salvation. As I said, no man can bring salvation to another man because we're all born sinners. You know, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, that, so, you know, we're all in need of a Savior. So I can't die for anybody. Nobody else can die for me. So, Now, as I said, Jesus never gave up his deity when he became flesh. Now, Jesus could be heard, and so as the word, people could hear God. You know, as the word, you know, that's what, when we speak, you know, I, I'm, you know, the word, you know, the words come out of my mouth, you know, he was speaking, you know, he is the word. You know, as the word, Jesus gave his seven I am statements in John confirming he is God. You know, we've been, go, we just been going through those there in, uh, my study on the I am statements by Jesus. So, you know, we see in all those states over and over again, they confirmed that he was claiming to be God because he is God. You know, so they were, they were clearly showing Jesus is God. Now, 1 John 1, 2 goes along with John chapter 1, verse 14, showing that the word became flesh. Now, this verse says that Jesus, or the word of life, was manifested, which means made known to man. That's what the word manifested means. It means 
made known. You know, in other words, he was he was made known to man. He was shown, you know, he they were shown to, to people that he is the God man. The word became a man. As I said, that's it's important. You know, he had to be that man. He couldn't just been God. You know, he had to take the place of man. And when I talk about man, I'm talking about, you know, mankind here, that, you know, man is a generic, that, you know, for every man, woman, boy, or girl, or whatever, that, you know, he, but, and, but he literally became a man, a literal man here, in this sense, he became a literal man, but he died for all men, all people, all men, women, children, and, but, you know, as a, as a, the word himself, though, he became a man, you know, I mean, I've seen people where they claim that, you know, God, it was a woman, or, or, you know, whatever. No, he was a man. Jesus was a man. God is a man. You know, God the Father is a man. That's why he's God the Father, not God the Mother, you know. The verse continues by saying that Jesus gives eternal life. Now, verse 1 calls him the word of life. This shows that it's only Jesus who can give you life. As the creator Jesus gave birth to us all, but as the Savior, he gives everlasting spiritual life to those who call upon him. No one can have life without Jesus. You know, Jesus is, was our creator. He's the one that created everything. You know, so he, not only all the stars and everything else, and angels and so forth, but every one of us is, you know, when we're created in the womb, when, we're, when a uh, woman gets, gets pregnant, then she... Uh, you know, Jesus creates that baby that's in that womb. That's why when people want to abort it, you know, they're murdering a child that God has created. You know, it's not a blob or something in there. It is a child that Jesus has created. But just because someone's born, they might physically, I said it before, might be talking, physically breathing, but they're not spiritually alive. We're all born in sin. That's why we must be born again and ask Jesus to be our Savior. Then... We get spiritual life if you get born again, get saved. You know, if you ask Jesus to save you, admit you're a sinner, and ask Jesus to save you, that you need Jesus as your Savior, then you can get saved, and then you'll have spiritual life, and then you'll have everlasting life. You know, but otherwise, you're you're spiritually always dead. You never, in God's eyes, you've never been alive. You know, you might have been physically here on earth, but you're never alive. So, you know, just because, as I said, so there's a difference between Jesus did create everybody for a physical birth, but not everybody is a child of God because we're not all born again. Now, Jesus holds the universe together, and that includes our bodies. But more important than our physical bodies, he gives us spiritual life as a person who can only be born again and reunited with God by his son, Jesus, who is the Word. You know, as I said, that's significant. So, but let's take a look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. <coughs> Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You know, all things consist. In other words, you know, Jesus, he holds the very atoms together that, that, you know, everything is made up of elements, which those elements are then made up of, of atoms and so forth. And, you know, your protons, your electrons, neutrons, and so forth. And it's Jesus that holds all that stuff together. You know, that's why it tells us in Peter later on, uh, Second Peter, I believe this, where the, the elements are going to even, even, you know, the, they're all going to melt when we get the new heavens and, and new earth. And, you know, Jesus will separate those things, burn them all up. But, you know, right now, he's the one holding everything together. Otherwise, everything would just fall apart. Now, the next verse that shows Jesus as the word is 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, which shows Jesus as a part of the Godhead and clearly as the second person of that Godhead. So turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now this first shows Jesus as the Word is one with the other two persons of the Godhead, showing there is one God. 
you know, clearly shows in this verse that Jesus is the second person of the Godhead. And again, <coughs> excuse me. And again, so we know that that uh, you know Jesus is that word. You know that that uh, Jesus is God. You know He's part of the Godhead. You know, so again, you know, it's another way of showing you that Jesus is God. You know, I said this many times before, but this is the one verse that many, most of your modern crypt Bibles remove this verse in one way or another, either through literally removing it or, you know, they'll condense like parts from eight and so forth. It makes it look like the verse isn't missing, other like, unlike other verses where they completely remove, you know, but they're gutless to totally remove this one in that sense. So it looks like the verse is there, but it's not. Or, you know, in a couple cases, then they'll remove it by a footnote, say it really doesn't belong there, but... Satan doesn't want this verse in there because it's the one verse in Scripture that basically shows the Godhead. You know, people call it the Trinity, but Scripture calls it the Godhead. And, you know, clearly shows that there are there's one God, but in three persons. You know, that's why it says, and these three are one. You know, it doesn't say that it's three gods like the Muslims claim we, we worship and so forth. So, but we're about out of time here, but I want to go just... Tiny bit longer here. Let me just finish up this little bit here. <clears throat> the final time we see Jesus as the Word is found in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, where he is called the Word of God. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. Okay, Revelation chapter 19, verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The very words that Jesus speak show he is God. Now Jesus, as the Word, spoke the universe into existence. Let's look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. You know, every, the very words he speaks, it's significant. So... <clears throat> so Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You know, Jesus is the one who made and created the world. Now, his very word will also end the battle of Armageddon. The very words of God are compared to a sword. We see in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, we just read that the clothes Jesus is wearing is a vesture dipped in blood. That blood was the precious blood that Jesus shed for us on the cross at Calvary in order to bring us everlasting salvation. This blood was God's blood. You know, and that's, that's significant to understand. This, again, this wasn't just blood that, that of a regular man. This was God's blood. And I told you before where, um, can't think of the guy's name right now, but anyway, you know, he found the Ark of the Covenant and he, he um, found that it was, you know, inside that it had blood on it that had dripped down from when he was on the cross and had gone down and was landed on the mercy seat. And when he had it tested, and he didn't tell anybody where he got this blood from or where it was, then they showed that it actually had 24 chromosomes. Well, normally blood has 46 chromosomes, 23 from the mom and 23 from the dad. Well, this one had the 23 from his mom or Mary, but he had one from the Holy Ghost. So he had 24 chromosomes, which 24 is also the number for the priesthood, which Jesus is our high priest. And so we see that this was not just some ordinary blood. This was God's blood, you know, that he was a man, but he had God's blood in him. But this blood purchased the church, as Acts chapter 20, verse 28 tells us. It is only this blood that can bring us salvation. You know, but in uh, Revelation there, you know, like I said, we'll, um, you know, he's, he has a sword in his mouth. And... Uh, Yeah, Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Then, I'm going to read this in one more verse, and then we're going to stop it. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, 
that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. <clears throat> you know, this his word is a sword. As I said, what he speaks happens. He spoke in creation came into existence. He's going to speak, and the battle of Armageddon is going to end, and these people are going to be cast into the, to, uh, to hell. And, uh, you know, when he speaks, it happens. Now, let's uh, quickly look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. As I said, this was, uh, it purchased the very church. You know, remember, the church is the, the bride, bride of Jesus. <clears throat> That's why we need to live like that. But Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. You know, it's because Jesus died on that cross. That's how we have the church today. That, um, you know, he purchased that with his own blood. So again, we see that that was God's blood. Now, in closing, we're going to finish with this here. Notice that all seven occurrences of Jesus and his name of the word are all found in books written by the Apostle John. You know, I mentioned this well ago, but, you know, the Gospel of John, was the whole purpose of it is to show that Jesus is God. But this is probably because John saw more of Jesus in his full glory as God than anyone else when Jesus revealed himself to John while giving him the book of Revelation. You know, it's believed by some that, that the Gospel of John was the last book ever written. It was written just after Re uh, Revelation, when he'd just be seen all his glory of, you know, as I said, Revelation shows Jesus in his full deity and glory. And some say that, that he wrote John shortly after that. Others say a little bit before, but either way, whatever. You know, John saw all this stuff. That's why his writings are the ones that show things you know, all about Jesus being God, you know, whether it's Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John, or Revelation, you know, all five of his books, they clearly show that Jesus is God. And he's the only one that gives Jesus that title of capitalized word. And so, you know, again, I don't think it's it, it's a coincidence that that's the way it is, that, that you know, John is, wants people to understand that Jesus is God. And so, you know, not only that, but, you know, we know that the number seven, means perfection or completeness, spiritual uh, completeness and so forth. And so, you know, again, we know that number seven is God's number. So, you know, it's not a uh, um, coincidence that that uh, he it's only found seven times where, you know, he is the capitalized word. And we're going to look at continue this next week and look a little bit more at uh you know, the difference between the capitalized word and the lowercase word, which, you know, modern Bibles and people try to corrupt that. And we're going to look at that and they need to stop that because you're destroying a lot of things here. But uh, like I said, we'll continue this next week as we, you know, just before we have uh, uh, Christmas Eve there. And, you know, I'm going to look, like I said, this is important, I think, to look at the story of Christmas a little bit different than, you know, all, oftentimes it's, it's portrayed. And so, you know, because as I said, we need to understand that wasn't just some ordinary baby in there. This was God made in the flesh. You know, that this was a precious little baby, far more than anything that, that we see today, that this baby grew up, become a man. You know, people want to leave, the you know, Roman Catholic Church want to leave him as a baby. You know, that baby grew up, become a man, and then he later died on a cross for you and I, so that we can have everlasting life. He died, took our place on the cross, shed his precious blood for our sins so that we could have everlasting life. You know, let's not make that for naught. That if someone's not saved, then stay at the day of salvation. So turn to the Lord Jesus and get saved. Admit that you need a savior and that you're a sinner and ask Jesus to save you. That, you know, what better way to celebrate Christmas than to actually be saved by the very one that we're supposed to be celebrating. So let's have a word of a prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us here to study on how Jesus was made flesh. You know, he, as the word, was made flesh. And he dwelt among us. You know, and that's significant too. That you don't just, you know, people say, well, you know, you were the creator. And then, but then you just leave us, uh, let us go about doing our own things. No, you were very much involved in your creation. You 
are in control of everything. You, you dwelt among us. You didn't just leave us to be by ourselves and leave us to hang by the devil. You, you dwelt among us. And you still dwell among us if you're believers. You, know, you live within our hearts. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless the second service. Just be with each and every one. Continued health for everybody. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.